In this video presentation, we would like to consider a vital question. Did this world and everything in it originate by accident or by design? Did this planet and all living things come into being by blind chance or by divine purpose? Consider an airplane cockpit. Did intelligent people design, engineer, and construct this cockpit? With all its elaborate instruments? Or did it just originate by accident? The answer seems quite obvious to any thinking person. The airplane cockpit is an amazing example of modern technology and mechanical excellence. What would you think of someone who said the airplane cockpit was not planned by anyone but came about by some strange accident or by mere coincidence? How would the engineers, designers, and scientists who planned and built it react to such a thought? they would probably be highly insulted. Let us now consider some of the wonders of our world. Was anyone responsible for the brilliant colors in these creatures, or did they just happen? When we see beautiful colors in a painting, we normally assume that an artist was responsible. No one would dispute that this painting of a floral arrangement was made by someone, a gifted artist. When we gaze upon the beautiful flowers in our world, were they made by no one? Did this robot, this mechanical wonder, come about by accident, or was it designed? What about a real person? Did the person originate by blind chance? Or was the person intelligently designed? Was this mechanical hand designed? Think of the marvels of the human hand. Did the hand evolve by blind chance? and unguided natural processes? A circuit board was obviously made by intelligent people. 
The human brain, far more complex than any man-made circuit board, did that evolve by accident? Airplanes flying in formation, was this planned? Birds flying in formation, is this a mere coincidence? No one would doubt that cameras are made by intelligent people. Did the human eye evolve by random processes? It took thousands of years before man could discover how to fly. Birds seem to be perfectly designed for flight. Did this come about by mere accident? Bats use radar. And dolphins use echolocation. Did this all come about by blind chance? People enjoy wonderful fireworks displays made by man. Consider the glorious display of the northern lights. Was that made by no one? Designed? Was this person made by no one? Here is an elaborate home, planned, designed, and built by people. The world we live in, was it unplanned, undesigned, made by no one? Someone made the teddy bear, a fact obvious to all. It's a very simple design. What about the real bear, which is millions of times more complex than the stuffed animal? Did anyone make the real bear? It took intelligent men until the 19th century to invent the light bulb. What about the bulb that lights our planet? The sun, did it come about by blind chance? Is it an accident that the sun is just the right distance from the earth? So that we are neither scorched nor frozen? Design? No design? Everyone would agree that the submarine was designed and engineered by brilliant men. The largest creature on Earth is perfectly equipped for its ocean environment. Was the whale designed by no one? Does it make sense to explain the metamorphosis of a butterfly as something that was unplanned the result of undirected natural processes, unguided except by blind chance, and originating by pure accident? Is anyone responsible for the amazing design of the woodpecker? It has a flexible skull made of plate-like bones which help to minimize damage from pecking. 
Its brain is suspended in a fatty, gelatinous fluid for cushioning. It has a bone that wraps all around the skull, acting like concrete rebar and protecting the brain. It also has a third eyelid which helps to keep the eye from popping right out of the woodpecker's head. Why do woodpeckers not get headaches? A woodpecker strikes its head against a tree with amazing force repeatedly and yet its brain is protected by an amazing design. Brilliant men are studying these amazing birds in order to try to design better and safer football helmets. In 1948, Swiss engineer George de Mestral examined burrs plucked from his pants and from his dog's coat after a hike. He found that the spines of the burrs were tipped with tiny hooks. This clue from nature enabled him to invent Velcro which is widely used today. It was a brilliant invention, but it was based on a design already found in the natural world. He copied someone else's idea. Why are sharks so speedy? An electron micrograph reveals the shark skin's secret to speed. Tooth-like scales called dermal denticles you see, water races through the micro grooves without tumbling, reducing friction. Naval ships may apply synthetic coatings to their hulls, copied after the amazing design of shark skin. Are we to conclude that the design of the hulls of naval ships will be improved by copying the design of a shark? A design which is really no design at all, but a randomly evolved structure produced by blind chance over time apart from any intelligence? Have you heard of a Speedo swimsuit? This swimsuit mimics the denticles on a shark skin, reducing drag. It was introduced in the year 2000, and this swimsuit has helped competitive swimmers set scores of world records. Consider the legs of a horse. A horse can gallop at a speed of 50 kilometers per hour. Although this requires considerable mechanical work, relative little energy is spent. How is that possible? The secret is in the horse's leg. Consider what occurs when a horse gallops Elastic muscle tendon units absorb energy when the leg steps onto the ground, and much like a spring, they return it, propelling the horse forward. Furthermore, at a gallop, the horse's legs vibrate at high frequencies that could injure its tendons. However, the muscles in the legs act as dampers Researchers call this structure a highly specialized muscle tendon design that provides both agility and strength. Engineers are trying to imitate the horse's legs for use in four-legged robots. However, according to the Biomimetic Robotics Laboratory, of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the complexity of the design cannot be easily duplicated with current materials and engineering knowledge. We are familiar with the GPS, an amazing instrument designed by man. What about monarch butterfly and bird and salmon migrations? How do these creatures navigate over hundreds of miles to specific locations? Did all these migrations happen by accident? And as the result of blind chance, 
Or were these navigational skills programmed into these creatures by a higher intelligence? Which of these two scenarios represents reality? Here's the first scenario. In the beginning, God created. We find that verse in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now here's the second scenario. In the beginning, it just happened. No intelligence, no design, no planning, no purpose, and no God. In the Bible, the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, we read this. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Who is responsible for this world and for everything in it? Who is the intelligent designer? Consider the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by him, referring to Jesus Christ. And without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16 says this. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, all things were created by him and for him. Ephesians 3 verse 9 says, God created all things by Jesus Christ. And Revelation 4:11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We would like you to come to know the one who has made all things by his unsearchable wisdom and great power. The following message is very important. It's by Dr. Charles Woodbridge. Dr. Woodbridge said the following, Dear friend, I have some good news for you. It is very good news. It has blessed the souls of millions of men women, boys, and girls through the centuries. It is good tidings of great joy. It can be of great blessing to you. I invite you to read about this good news with great care. But as a faithful servant of the Lord, I must tell you at once some bad news. It is very bad news. We cannot fully appreciate the good news unless we understand the bad news. Almighty God is righteous. He is holy. He has revealed to men his righteousness and holy law. The bad news is that we have all, without exception, broken God's law or failed to live up to its righteous demands. We have transgressed the law in words, in thoughts, and in deeds. We have all sinned against God as we're told in Romans 3, verse 23. But worse, God will not tolerate sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. And death refers to separation from God through all eternity. And to cap the dreadful climax, we cannot save ourselves from our dire predicament. Our character will not save us. Our conduct will not save us. 
Our willpower will not save us. Our church membership will not save us. Our pastor or our priest will not save us. We desperately need a Savior. And now for the good news. It is true that God is righteous and holy, but He is also loving, kind, merciful, and compassionate. He loves us with an infinite and tender love. He loves us so much that He intervened in human history and sent us the Savior we need. Who is the Savior, this wonderful love gift from God the Father? He is Jesus Christ, the ever-blessed Son of the living God. Oh, how we thank and praise the Almighty for stooping to our needs and rescuing us from our dismal plight. What marvelous good news this is, and how specifically was the problem of our sin and resultant death divinely solved. The Bible is crystal clear. Let us hear its message with humble, thankful hearts. Let us heed its solemn warnings and gracious invitation. Let us gladly submit to its plain, compelling summons. This is what the blessed Lord Jesus did for lost sinners. This is good news indeed. He, the sinless Son of God, bore the guilt and shame of our sins upon himself. He bore our sins in his own body. He did that when he died on the cross of Calvary. He died for our sins. And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. The prophet Isaiah writes eloquently, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 verse 5. The justice of God was revealed in the verdict of death. The love of God was revealed in that the death was visited not upon sinners who deserved it, but upon his dearly beloved Son. What then is my privilege and duty? I must recognize my need of a Savior. I must realize that by nature I am a lost sinner and I must bow my heart in loving devotion and sincere faith before the Lord Jesus Christ, the lover of my soul. With all my being, my intellect, feeling, and will, I must trust Him as my own personal Savior, as the one who shed His precious blood on the cross that I might be cleansed, forgiven, and accepted as righteous in the sight of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, the Bible says in Acts 16, 31. You will be saved if you simply believe, saved from the guilt and penalty of sin, born again into the family of God, and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God. This is God's plan of salvation. Those who gladly embrace the plan and receive Christ as their Savior have everlasting life. Their feet are planted squarely on the royal highway of blessing that leads them to heaven, their everlasting home. Those who reject the Savior, and how I hope that you are not in this group, will experience a visitation of the wrath of God. Who told us this? The beloved Apostle John. He gave us a solemn warning found in John 3 verse 36. 
He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? Trust Jesus Christ with all your heart as your dear Savior, and you enter at once into eternal life, never to be separated from the Lord you love. But please notice the rest of John 3.36. It says, And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God. What tragedy. What visitation of judgment. What irreparable loss. Let us believe God. Let us take him at his word. Let us stake our soul's immortal destiny on the finished work of Christ on our behalf. If our hearts are humble and receptive, if we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith, our everlasting portion will be joy forever in his blessed presence. Heaven's gates will open before our wondering view. We shall know the inexpressible delight of being forever in the presence of our adorable Lord. My friend, what is your response to the gracious summons of the Son of God? I trust that it is a glad, positive, sincere, mature affirmation of faith. I plead with you to trust Christ as your Savior, to rejoice that your sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake, and to join the company of the redeemed.